Good morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning and hello, kids, and welcome to season three and episode number 353, yes, of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryer Media Network. Yeah! Oh. I don't know why I did that. I just felt like it. Just Sounds call like it whimsy. A little indigestion, perhaps. <laughs> uh, today, recording day is Thursday, April 4th, 2024. The 4th of the 4th and 24. Yeah. Or the 4th of 4th with your 2 4. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> me, 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 two, four. <laughs> I'm your host, the Eager Beaver, pronounce he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver Ray, and it's going to be a, uh, I'm not sure what kind of day it's going to be weather-wise. Uh, people were talking about potentially maybe a snow day happening. At least looks like there's going to be lots of scattered flurries. It's like around one or minus one, so it's going to be wet and neither like thick sloppy flakes or lots of rain or whatnot. But it's going to be wet. It was wet all day yesterday, and it's probably going to be wet until like sometime on Saturday or Sunday. So lots yeah. of wet. <laughs> Four days of misery, basically, is what it is. Not that we don't need the moisture. But it's going to be a couple of days of gray, early April, spring, cold, wet, damp. Ugh. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's, it's blech it's season. <laughs> Pretty much. But you know what? I'll take blech season over slush season. And we didn't have much of a slush season this year. So oh, it's slushy I'm good. here right now. Right? Oh, it is now? Ooh. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of slush season. Um, as you can hear, Kits and Cubs with me as always is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. We have a little nipple for you. Uh, sorry for the late start, but Mr. Grizzly was on doggy duty. Mr. Grizzly, how's your mental health doing today? I see you wincing. Mental health is uh, probably fine. I don't know. Uh, my physical health is horrible right now because when I took Mr. Mr. Mrs. Ms. Lola, Ms. Ms. Queen Lola out, she decided that, um, yeah, she wanted to chase what she thought was a squirrel. It was a phantom squirrel. Uh, and because it's icy and snowy and slushy and slippery out, and she has, you know, four paws and nails and can grip, and I was in boots, you know, I went for a little slip and slide. I didn't fall. I didn't hit the ground, but it kind of wrenched my back. So I'm right now in a tremendous amount of uh, physical pain in my lower back and wishing I had children's chewable morphine at a minimum because, oh boy, do I hurt. So mental health wise, I could be good. Don't know. I'm in so much physical pain right now. I, I can't even spell my name. Oh, I am so sorry to hear that. It, and this was just, you know, I just, she thought she saw a squirrel and she took off and I kind of flipped and wrench my back how that hurt i shouldn't have done that 
And uh, she didn't, you know, she didn't wipe out, and there was no squirrel. And I just, you know, I'm just, ouch, ouch. Oh. Didn't fall though, so you know. But it it's cold, windy, and miserable out there right now. Mm. Last night was worse though. Last night was worse. Uh, uh, Bridget, I, I I skipped out. I was like, I'm not going to Scotch and Cigar. She goes, Well, I want to go see the guys. I think she got halfway there and was like, This sucks, and turned around and came back because the <laughs> weather. It was raining and snowing really hard at the same time. Yep. And she has like a a really like a, a down like a down parka this thing mm -hmm. right like full length parka came in it was soaked right through I was like you were gone fifteen minutes she goes yeah it's really miserable out yep so, like I said blech weather yeah blech 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 that's that's the that's the that's the scientific meteorological term for it. I believe so. Yeah. Well, and the thing is, this time last year, this time last year, it was there was a lot of snow still left on the ground this time last year, uh, and and by the thirteenth, it we hit thirty two degrees, and it melted over like a two day period. Mm -hmm. but, but this year, the snow's been gone, like for weeks, like yeah. weeks. They they took the hockey boards, the rink, the outdoor rink that's been taken down for almost a month. I don't think it even. I don't think it made it to March, to be honest with you. Hmm. I think they took it down. Well, no, uh, we got Lola on March 4th, and it was gone by the 6th. Two days later, it was done. So, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I hope you feel better soon, my friend. Um, Thank you. In the news, kits and cups, in the news, uh, there is a lot going on. The Prime Minister is still on, and all of the government is still on the... Uh, pre-budget tour making announcements there will be uh, announcements more today on housing it seems to be the theme this will be the third day in a row and on the first day if you include uh, the renters policy there's been uh, four of the six days that they've been making announcements has something to do with lodging so clearly that's the one they're taking uh, most seriously um, other people in the media have noticed it and are starting to comment on uh, the strategy a lot of people are saying uh, it's a good idea and they're wondering why the government didn't do it sooner and uh, if you listen to the bridge with peter mansbridge they actually had a full discussion about that like what happened to government uh, secrecy on budget day and it's uh, you know um, basically they're saying you know th things have changed now yeah you know you, you, you know people uh, the, i mean it used to be a crime to leak stuff from the budget crime so that's a pretty yeah. strong word but. yeah it was it was like this really? uh oh yeah yeah it was it it, it 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 uh if if you were given the information embargoed and you let you let it out uh, right it okay. was uh yeah and uh you know if you were a minister if anything got out before the budget it was a you know, a firing offense for all intents and purposes mm -hmm. you you would have to step down so things have uh, have changed you know where we're at the point where we have so many things competing uh, for media mm. attention that you know when the budget does come out, uh, all the individual elements, they you know, they just look for the top line numbers. You know, how much more is it going to add to the debt? How much are we spending? What's the total spending? It's a good thing, a bad thing, and then you know, and then they run off, and we don't really talk about the policies or uh, what are the things in which the government is actually investing. And it's usually because of one day story because something happened somewhere in the world. Right. Right. right to knock it off. Uh, unless there's something like really big or controversial in the budget, you know, then the story disappears. So, uh, they are milking this and it seems to be working for them. Um, so, so we'll see how it uh, how it goes. One of the new stories, and uh, a lot of people caution because caution about this, and I do as well, um, because again, you know, I like polls because of mm. work I used to do. But polls are a snapshot in time, and they only tell you where you have been, not necessarily where you are going. But one of the big uh, news elements is that according to the pollster Nanos, over the last month. Uh, the liberals have uh, cut down the conservative lead in the polls. They had showed that uh, the conservatives were leading by 20% about one month ago at, at the beginning of March, and that's been cut down to 12% over the last month. Now, I'm not sure if this has something to do with the prime minister being out on Jesperson and you know, making more of these uh, press availabilities where he's answering questions directly in full sentences without necessarily launching into childish attacks and appears to be mastering his file and appears to be doing it with a little more fire and flame and vigor. 
and uh, putting out all these policies, trying to show that his government is not tired uh, or nor out of ideas. But over the past month, it has been noticed. Um, the spread between the spread, like I said, the spread between the parties has gone from twenty to twelve, uh, and there's been a spread as well in terms of uh, preferred prime minister because Pierre Polyev had taken over from the prime minister on that metric, and while he is still leading on that metric, uh, it would appear that Pierre may have peaked uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, with his preferred prime minister number reaching 36.9% four weeks ago, and he has now dropped to 33.4%. Uh, the prime minister uh, was not at a 12-month low. His actually 12-month uh, 12, 12 low has, was 18.6%. People thought that he was uh, would be the preferred prime minister. That over the last few weeks has uh, gone up uh, into the 21% range. So, I mean, it's still about a 12-point difference with Pierre Poliev, but that's a seven-point gap has been closed uh, in the last three months. But concurrently with this, uh, with Pierre maybe having peaked and maybe Trudeau being a bit on the rebound, and the Liberals being on the rebound, it comes with uh, the bottom falling out on the NDP fully, which is not uh, something the Conservatives need at a, at a point uh, not too long ago. The liberals and the conservatives were seemingly tied or within the margin of uh, error of one of another, one another. Uh, but now, uh, according to Nanos, uh, Chagmeet Singh is down to 49% as preferred prime minister, down from 17 four weeks ago in a 12 month high of uh, 20%. So uh, that's a six point drop from where he's been his highest point in the last year or so. Um, also, with that, Elizabeth May has gained a lot of ground. Uh, she's back down. She's back up to about uh, close to six percent, which is her usual territory. But that's up from a low of two point five. Mm. So she's been gaining a lot, and uh, that doesn't help Pierre because the two people he least wants to debate when it comes time are Elizabeth May and Yves Francois Blanchet. Yeah, because they'll skewer him and yeah. slice him and dice him. And as for him, well, he's at a 12-month high in terms of his popularity at the moment. That so, won't last. No, it won't last, but the Blachette's at a 12-month high. Oh, so, no, no, I, I thought you meant PP. No, no, uh, Blachette, PP is, uh, has dropped from his peak. And with that, uh, even Bernier is picking up a little. So mm. for PP's gamble to win, he needs Bernier not to be picking up. He needs the NDP and the Liberals to be close. And he would like to hope that uh, Blanchette would stumble somewhat in Quebec. So uh, while all of this is small numbers, mm -hmm. right, a 3% tick upwards is probably within the margin of error as well. But it seems to be a consistent trend over the last four weeks that they are slowly regaining a little bit of ground and the Conservatives are slowly losing a little bit. Probably not enough to make a difference into seat count projections at the moment. Uh, but enough to get people talking about it. Well, um, something you may not know about me, uh, you definitely don't know about me, is for years I used to have to uh, go into the media lockup when it was held at what is now called the Senate of Canada because that used to be the, um, at one time it was the central station, it was the railway station, uh, and then it became a... Uh, government house of some type. I can't remember what it was called exactly. They almost tore it down in 1966, which is, thank goodness, cooler heads prevailed because it's a beautiful example of uh, architecture in this city right across from the Chateau Laurier, which, like I said, now is the Senate of Canada. But I used to go in every year for the lockup and shut the building down for communications. So mm -hmm. no internet, no telephone, no radio, no, like literally we shut the building down and I had, I'd go in and they'd say, okay, shut it down at this hour and I'd shut it down. And then they would say, okay, 15 minutes and you go turn the building back on. So I'd have to go and enable all these services again. And because of the type of network that I was working on, it, I physically had to be there. So I'd shut it down. And then I just hang out for eight, eight, nine hours until <laughs> they were like, okay, you can do it now. I, I kind of look forward to it because it was a day where I didn't have to climb telephone poles in the cold spring. 
Mm. I just sat in a nice building and was fed lots of food and had some wonderful people to chat with, but there was no internet access, not on your phone, nothing. The building was blocked, shut down. Your phones were locked away from you. Uh, yeah, it was interesting, interesting, but I don't, I don't know what, what or who does that now, if that's still the case, but mm. yeah, I, I, I believe it still is, but it's, uh, the reason for it is becoming now less and less, uh, yes, yeah. Uh, people are wondering, well, okay, why are we doing the lockup then if everything's pretty much leaked? Now, there will obviously be some announcements on the day. The government always keeps something mm, for the day. So, uh, you know, that's it's still going to happen in the traditional way. But yes, we no longer have a, a concern for budget secrecy. Um, the other thing that's not going uh, very well for uh, Pierre, and it's something that we've mentioned on the show, uh, we might be losing certain of his topics. Uh, so, for example, between March 1st and March 29th, um, when asked what are your uh, what are your top issues of concern, uh, concern for inflation has is dropping. Uh, concern for the environment is back up again, mm -hmm. as we're entering wildfire season. Concern for healthcare is back up again. Concern about jobs in the economy is down, and concern about housing and cost of housing are down. Concerns about immigration are down. And concerns about needing to change the government are down. So all the things that are down are things that are helpful to the prime minister. And the few things that are up in terms of concerns that have switched the other way are environment and health care. And those things are also better topics for the prime minister than for the opposition. So where people's concerns seem to be start to to be shifting to align with the concerns that the prime minister uh, or that are more traditionally associated associated to liberals as being the party that would do better to deliver on them uh, for Canadians as support for the NDP is dropping, support for the bloc is rising, support for the Greens are rising. In fact, over the last four months, the prime minister is the only one of the leaders that has seen his... Uh, the, uh, of the top three leaders that has seen his personal numbers improve. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, one could say I mean, he was so low, there was no <laughs> where. Yeah, I mean, really. Yeah. But up he could go as well. So don't take too much stock. It's just one poll. It's just one pollster, reputable one, of course. But um, if people are looking for some signs that the honeymoon might be over and things might be reverting a little bit to the mean. This may be the first sign. It's the first sign that public opinion pollsters have seen in a long time mm. of sustained reversal over a period of about a month. And it seems that one of the reasons for this is because the prime minister has been wrestling the narrative back, control of the da daily narrative back from Pierre Polyev. Uh, Pierre Polyev seems to be at a fundraiser every single night. Well, of course, yeah, because, you know, the last few weeks. To him. Yes. So, um, but this, like I said, for people, we said on the show that, yes, we are definitely in the kicking the tires phase. And, you know, a lot of people say, you know, government fatigue. Yes, absolutely. This is the time where it usually happens. So, but again, a year and a half to two years and a half before an election is scheduled, probably not a lot of time to be placing a lot of bets based on the polls that are going on at the moment. So there's about 18 months of runway left and we know that time is not Pierre's friend and we know that scrutiny is not Pierre's friend. And as we get closer to that time, there is going to be more scrutiny. Mm -hmm. It seems that the prime minister's uh, policy is also of putting uh, the premiers on the back foot for a change by calling them out on not presenting carbon plans is being somewhat effective. Um, but we have a battle of wills here. It's almost a game of chicken. Newfoundland Premier Anthony uh, Fury. Mm -hmm. I believe it's Anthony. Uh, for some reason, I think mm -hmm. I got that wrong for the yeah, last. No, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. I have to look that up. I don't yeah. feel like typing at the moment, and, and everything on me hurts. So I'm <laughs> not going to type anything. Andrew Fury, not Anthony. I knew I Anthony had it wrong. Fury's a writer. He's a journalist. Yes. Yes, Andrew Fury, sorry, has uh, basically been calling out loud for the Prime Minister to hold a national sort of summit with premiers and first leaders mm -hmm. on the carbon price. Um, now, if you're mine and Mr. Grizzly's age, uh, these types of summits used to be a fairly common thing. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. The prime minister would go and meet all the leaders of the provinces and the territories all at once. And uh, usually it would end up being a gang up of uh, 13 against one and people trying to make the prime minister look bad unless they all had some agreement and they all had something wonderful to announce together. And uh, Stephen Harper tried it once and didn't like it and then stopped doing it. And it seems to have fallen out of favor. Now, our prime minister has done it a couple of times, um, but has not been doing it necessarily on demand or on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. So when, you know, he had to negotiate um, the top-ups to the CPP early in his mandate and, uh, and uh, you know, the initial health care arrangements, you know, he did have such meetings. Um, but he doesn't have them. They used to be, like, things that would happen at least once a year. And sometimes there'd be one with the, with the finance ministers or, you know, ministers uh, of a certain department altogether uh, in order, uh, if there was a uh, subject that was very topical at the moment, mm-hmm. um, Pierre Poliev is also calling, joining Andrew Fury and saying, "Yeah, let's have one of these national meetings." And there's a lot of people saying that, uh, contrary to what would be common wisdom, that it might actually be in the prime minister's best interest to actually do it this time given that he has put the premiers on the back foot because a lot of people are saying yeah why not have one of those meetings where the cameras are in there every now and then and we're watching the prime ministers ask the premiers go well what are you doing and watching the premiers go blah, 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 or try to come up with <laughs> You know, some things to say that make it appear like they're doing a lot and having the prime minister say you know what i call bullshit so <laughs> it might actually be in his best interest there because um yes while they're all trying to gang up on him um, again, the people are trying to push the narrative. Well, it would be sure be nice if the prime minister would work in collaboration with the provinces. But the whole point is that this policy was designed specifically for that purpose. The federal backstop, that's why they call it a backstop, mm-hmm. only applies if the provinces decide not to do it on their own. Like literally the inherent design of the program is provinces we want to work with you you come up with something first and if it's good enough you don't get the backstop it literally is the design so for all these people sitting there going the prime minister doesn't want to hear about for doesn't want to hear from the people of saskatchewan or the prime minister doesn't want to listen or the prime minister wants to impose his no the prime minister imposed that there will be a price you get to choose premier whether or not it applies in your province according to the federal backstop, well, and you can make sure that nobody has to pay a carbon tax if you do something another way, like, for example, join the cap-and-trade program or decide to do it all with incentives. You know, we had a cap-and-trade program and in Ontario, not. but Doug Ford canceled it. And and who's that Bruce Bayman, Banman, whatever the hell that clown's name is, keeps going on about how, I just paid $81 for three stakes in British Columbia thanks to EB and Trudeau for their coalition. And, the, and the, I'm like, that you lying, duplicitous son of a Yep. British Columbia has had a, f- a program for years. Yep. It's not even the federal one. It's and not British, the federal one, which is and, it's like, it's like how uh, your lie isn't yeah. even good. It's not even a good lie. It's yeah. so easily disprovable. Yep. And it matches the federal program. It's also at $80 a ton and BC has its own rebate program that it, uh, that it has had it for years. It's had it for years and it precedes the federal one. In fact, the federal government probably modeled their program on BC's just like they modeled the Dutch child care program on Quebec's who also have been doing it for you know, the child care program. It was the 25th year in Quebec or something. Yeah. So, uh, you know, BC did it uh, way before everybody else. So uh, so you see these maps going around as well, saying that everybody pays $80 per ton, but Quebec pays $57 per ton. Ha ha, how is this fair? I guess they had a it's like they have a program. They have a carbon, they're on the carbon market. If they found a way to get $80 worth of carbon reductions that meet the federal federal per ton uh, uh, to cover the $80 per ton fee that's charged for the federal government in another way that costs them only 57. That's good on them. They made a smart decision. Maybe others, it sounds like the provinces are complaining about it. It sounds like you should join the carbon market. (laughs) <laughs> right? It's like all these people that complain about unions and then turn around and says, I can't believe it. Like, I haven't gotten a raise in two years. So it sounds like you need a union. Mm-hmm. 
rather than complaining that other people do have a union that helps negotiate for themselves like you need to join one. This was like, you know, <laughs> it's like if you're upset that Quebec has found a way to do it in a manner that's cheaper, sounds like you need to join the carbon market. Not complaining the fact that Quebec was smart enough to figure out that the carbon market might be a cheaper way. And that's assuming if that meme of $57 for Quebec is true, because we know that Quebec bashing is like conservative Alberta's favorite winter sport. Why does Quebec get this and we don't? Uh, well. We should be more like Quebec. Uh. <laughs> uh, I still can't get over that. We should have a where we take money from the oil companies and put it into a, into a fund that we, yeah, it's called the Heritage Fund. You've had it since the 1980s and Norway came, saw it and duplicated it. And the difference was Norway actually continued to put it. <sighs> yeah, indeed. And it's like, and you know, if we're talking about I think it was like it was Max Fawcett, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken. But he was talking about like, you know, he's getting like really up tired with people. Uh, well, tired, facetiously goes. I love it when Alberta conservatives try to play the Norway card. Shall we talk about Norway's 79% tax on oil extraction? It's 25% economy-wide sales tax. Oh, right. You just want to talk about equalization. Funny that. Uh, mm. So... Because when you compare yourself to other countries, you've got to compare everything, right? So when Pierre Polyev is comparing Canada's uh, housing prices to the United States, um, yes, but uh, are you living in a neighborhood that has lots of gun crime? Uh, you still, yeah, you know, you're paying less for your house, but you still are paying more for your health care. Way more. You're still at greater Wait. risk of personal bankruptcy as a result of a healthcare issue. Mm -hmm. so you can't just say you can't just look at the housing price from two countries and say, "Oh my God, they've got it so easy." There's more to living your life. There's more to managing your personal budget than how much you pay for lodging. Well, and, and somebody pointed that out to me the other day when I was talking about Norway and their programs and what they've done. They're like, "Well, you can't compare Canada to Norway because we're ten times their population," and blah blah blah. I'm like. Fair, fair enough. Fair point. You're right. It's not an apple to an apple. It's an apple to an orange. But some of the programs they have, they got from us. <laughs> like literally, they saw what we were doing and go, you know what? We, we, we could do that and we could make it better. Yeah. Which is what a progressive nation does. Sees a good idea somewhere and says, we can make it better. Yeah. So you don't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel all the time. I mean, and here's the thing when it comes to that. So the entirety of conservative policy is literally that. Mm -hmm. What the conservatives are doing right now here in Canada is they look south to the United States and they looked towards the UK when they had, you know, Farage and Boris Johnson. They said, hey, that worked there. Let's just do the same stupid, dumb things they did over there, over here, and probably it will work over here. Yeah. So literally, it's just plagiarism and copying there's this particular conservative party has not had an original idea in a very 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 long time like a very long time yeah a lot of this stuff is political plagiarism over here so um yeah just eyes wide open kits and cubs eyes wide open now there are um more things um to put it. I, there's a clip I want to play for you because we have a little bit of time and I want to do it while we still have time. And it's of um, former parliamentary budget officer Kevin Page. Um, because the conservatives are trying to convince us and have been trying to convince us for the longest time that uh, we are pretty, we're on the verge of being a basket case economy because of Trudeau's profligate spending. Um, I got nothing. There's nothing on that. Tab. There's nothing. What do you mean? There's nothing on it. Um, well, look. Let me show you. This, this is what I get. Um, th this is what I get when I punch it in. <laughs> like literally, nothing on it. Yeah. See, it just goes blank each time. I don't know what's going on there. Okay, hold on. I'll get you a different one for some reason. There we go. Let's try this link instead. Sorry about that, kids and cubs. Um, yeah, so that works. Yeah, they're trying to make us believe that, uh, you know, Trudeau spent us into the ground and we're like one or two, just like they're trying to make people believe the next to 3.3 .3 cents per liter of gas is the, the difference between them 
housing themselves and not, or 17 cents per liter if you're counting the carbon price since the beginning. What, and what is the Freedom Convoy group of the ignorance, the horde of ignorance doing? Driving around the country to protest the extra... Th yes. Gas is too expensive. Watch me drive hundreds Everywhere. of kilometers in my vehicle to protest that gas is too expensive. Yeah, you really thought that one out, did you? I could not write up something so absurd. I couldn't come uh, up. I'd be like, I got an idea. Here's how we're going to protest the, the price of fuel. We're going to drive around. We're going to have blockades and drive around, and we're going to slow roll to protest how much money I just spent doing what I'm... Wait a second. Yep. What I just claimed I'm too broke to do. All right. Um, so yeah, this... It, like Ellen says, in my six-figure truck. <laughs> 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 exactly. <laughs> exactly. Oh God, the, the the level of ignorance and and stupidity and and, and willful ignorance is what it is. It's willful ignorance. It's okay. you are willfully ignoring simple facts. I'm gonna protest that three cent tax because it's making me go broke, according to every university study and every economist available. Uh, that's not actually causing an increase in anything that you consume. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's like those people, like I said, that are showing their gas bills or the other one that you might've seen this one on the, on social media the other day, the lady that was showing her breakfast bill saying mm -hmm. $40 for a basic breakfast. And then you realize like she's ate at a luxury hotel, you know, York mills, or if she just like s stepped out her hotel door and taken a couple of steps there was a tim hortons right there where she could have gotten like um a, a, five bucks a muffin thing for friday it's like you chose to eat at a luxury hotel yeah, you're gonna pay for it sorry it's just you ate at the restaurant at a luxury hotel of course it's 40 dollars for breakfast that's how it rolls that's, yeah, I mean, that's like know. being surprised that your valet parking cost you <laughs> God, $50 for valet parking, life in Trudeau's Canada. I remember when valet parking used to be $49. Under Stephen Harper, it was $48. Shit, girl. Oh, that, was, <laughs> that was eight years ago. Yeah. I, All right. So I, this is really, this is good. Uh, this is Kevin Page and you, like, you know, a lot of Kevin... Kevin Page earned a lot of respect from Canadians based on the time that he was parliamentary budget officer because, yeah, well, nothing seems to bother him much. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. He has this very nonplussed affect. And uh, it's one of the reasons I love him because when he says there's time to panic and when he says it's not time to panic, it pretty much sounds the same coming from him. So, <laughs> but here we go. Let's put this, I, I'm going to just play it because it's, uh, people need to see this. Okay, just... Before we go there, just yeah. one second before we go there. So you know how we're talking about price increases and this and that and how, how things are, affect other things. Uh, Bridget needs to, uh, oh, oh, sorry, yeah, she's getting me a cup of coffee. <laughs> she needs to uh, head home in a minute to, to uh, help her daughter out and is going to take an Uber. Ordinarily, that's like 8 or $10. Mm -hmm. Not today. 26 bucks. Surge pricing. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Like, Some people thought that that would be a good idea for food. Yeah, no. Oh, no, no. Thank you. That idea lasted all about like six hours in the public sphere before yeah. it got shot down. Yeah. Surge pricing for food. Oh, people are hungry. Let's charge them more. I. <sighs> okay. Let's. Uh, I'm gonna, you want me to start this right from the beginning? Yeah, too? absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll, uh, we'll do it right from the very get go and give me a minute. And uh, yeah. All right. Here we go. The federal government releases its annual budget on April 16th. There is a lot of pressure on the government to announce more help for Canadians struggling with the cost of living. But is there any fiscal room to do that? Kevin Page is the president of the Institute of Fiscal Studies and Democracy at the University of Ottawa, and he joins me now. Kevin Page, always good to see you. Thanks for coming in. Good to be with you. You've assessed the country's finances as not great, not bad. What does that mean for the public expectations going into this budget, do you think? Yeah, it means um, 
we've taken on a lot of debt like because of COVID uh, and all those fiscal supports during COVID. So we've lost a lot of fiscal room. Um, you know, those debt numbers, debt to GDP numbers, even the deficit is, is elevated right now. So um, that's the, the, you know, the not so good part. I mean, the, you know, the, the better part, I think, is is the fact that still our numbers, and we hear this from the Deputy Prime Minister, the Finance Minister Freeland, that like we're still way better off on a relative basis. You know, our debt numbers, our, our budget balance numbers are way better than the U.S., way better than the EU. So, so when people talk about the situation we're in, maybe in terms of it being on the verge of a crisis, how should we view that? Because we've heard business groups saying they need to cut spending, the debt servicing is getting too high, we've got to invest in productivity. The Conservatives are saying, you know, that they're going to fix this budget. How should we assess how precarious the finances are compared? Yeah, there's, there's absolutely no crisis in terms of like a, a public finance crisis. I think, you know, all those numbers that, you know, that people allude to, uh, we're, you know, yeah, we're, again, it's elevated debt. I think um, if you look at the budgetary balance, we're talking about something around $40 billion in terms of a deficit, a percentage of GDP about one and a half. Um, you know, if you go back to the 80s, we ran deficits at five, six percentage points of GDP, not one and a half percent. If you compare us with the United States, they're at six and a half percent as a percentage of GDP. That would be like $170 billion in Canada. Mm. So I think, the, yeah, the, I don't think the deficit is out of whack. The interest costs are, again, they're about a little over 1%. You know, through the, through the 80s, they were at five, six percent as percentage points of GDP. So it's, we're still near record lows on interest as a percentage of GDP. So I think in terms of, again, we're triple A in terms of right. investment grade um, bonds and bills. So uh, where's the crisis? So uh, on that, I mean, there's a, they are facing a bit of a political crisis. I, th I think it's fair to say that when you look at where they are in terms of public opinion, this current government. And, and they've made some promises to deliver on things, but also made some promises to sort of move to this fiscal anchor uh, and, and keeping, you know, deficits of about 1% of GDP going forward and, and rein it in. Can they do that and deliver on things like pharmacare, uh, you know, uh, move on housing? And we've seen the child care program kind of having a failure to launch at, at the scale they are hoping, all of which might require more government money. Can they deliver on these things and, and keep that level of discipline they're promising? Well, I think they can't deficit finance, you know, large new structural programs, including pharmacare programs. They're going to have to find offsets. Um, so if this budget is important strategically for them, I think they're going to have to find some fiscal room between now and the next election. Um, yeah, I think to the critics' point is, you know, the Liberals have increased spending significantly. Uh, you know, and uh, in, in nominal dollar terms as a percentage of GDP, as a percentage of GDP, about uh, two full percentage points. That's like $60 billion higher as, you know, program spending relative to GDP. So that's a lot of spending. Right. And there hasn't been a lot of constraint. Uh, so far. So, yeah, I think it's we'll have to wait and see. So how do they do that now? Uh, do that constraint at this stage in the life cycle of a government with an election 18 months away? I mean, you said find fiscal room. So that yeah. means cuts somewhere, right? Or, or tax hikes somewhere. How do they do that uh, with the time they have in a way that uh, is palatable and viable? Yeah, I heard uh, a U.S. commentator talk about um, in the U.S. Democrats being good at addition but not subtraction. I think you could use the same reference to the liberals. They're good at addition but not subtraction. I think how do they do that? They have to cut spending. And if you can, you know, you can go, you know, arithmetically, you can look at spending. They've grown the base of, of spending significantly, um, including just, you know, operation costs. You know, and so there's opportunities to find savings. They're going to have to cut to find room, to, you know, to finance new programs. But where are the areas where you think they could do that? Like, like, is there a soft spot in the size of the state, yeah. you know, where they could start cutting things back? Operations. Yeah, you just, it's very swollen. If you look at, you know, when they came into office, you look at the size of the wage bill or, or non-wage operating spending, uh, and you look at the, just the growth of government. Um, I think it's, you know, it's, 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 it's grown significantly. Yeah, there's, so there's, there's significant savings there in the billions of dollars. And I think that's just, that's one area they're going to have to find. Unfortunately, they've kind of already booked it. You know, if you look at the fiscal planning framework, they're trying to hold that, that kind of spending constant. Um, but it's still constant at a very high level. So when you talk about operations, you talk about the size of the civil service, yes. reducing the number of jobs in, in the civil service? Yeah. In any specific areas that you get? Because people would say, look, you need this for the service delivery, or you need this, you know, to manage these programs, or you need this to, to do whatever it is, the good things that government does. Where are the areas where you think uh, they could target? I think it's across the board. I think in this case, normally, uh, having been a public servant for many years, when you hear politicians talk about across the board cuts, we don't like it. Right. But I think if you look at the growth, you know, it's the, the growth is pretty, you know, since 2015 by the, you know, the Liberal government, it's been across the board. There, there's about 
two, well, there's two budgets left potentially between the next election and a, who knows how a handful of, of interest rate decision points for, for the Bank of Canada. How much do you think what Tiff Macklem and, and the, the, the Board of Governors there may do on interest rate weighs into the decision making process right now? How, do, how does Christian Freeland factor that into the decision she's making for the budget? Well, I think in terms of the economy, in terms of short term, I think the, gov the, the Bank of Canada is the game changer. We need to get these interest rates down. There's an enormous amount of debt in the Canadian economy. Even on a relative basis, when we compare our, our economy with other economies, we're carrying a lot of debt at the household level relative to disposable income. Uh, if you look at like mortgage interest debt, uh, it's we've never been this high before as a percentage of disposable income. So these, uh, you know, holding, you know, having uh, five-year conventional mortgage interest rates at six and a half percent, this is really going to hurt a lot of families as we as we move into 2024. So it's the game changer. We need to get interest rates down. I think to maintain a soft landing. I think at this point. Mm. Um, so, yeah, they think the, you know, Minister Freeland is counting on this being probably a difficult year economically, slow growth, high interest rates, but a reduction of interest rates and then growth picking up in 2025 and then maybe a better electoral prospects. So, so we, obviously she can't control, uh, Christian Freeland cannot control what the governor of the Bank of Canada does. Um, so, so what does she you know, need to do in terms of reining in the spending, knowing, anticipating there's going to be cuts in interest rates at some point this year? I mean, what's at risk? for the government, for the economy, if, if they don't bring in this level of fiscal discipline that everyone is suggesting that, that, that they need? Yeah, I think it's trust and credibility on, on, as, in terms of managing public finances. Um, and I think, like, so she's, you know, Minister Freeland's added targets, you know, in t for 2000 and, um, and this year, 24 or 25, trying to keep the deficit at 40 billion, as you've already alluded to in the outer years, to get the deficit at, you know, 1% or low as a percentage of GDP. She has to hit those targets. Otherwise, I think she'll lose credibility and trust. Because they haven't really hit a target yet. I, I mean, there's reasons for that. The, the pandemic is a good reason. But, but there have been, outside of those years even, they, they've never sort of hit sort of modest deficits that were sort of that the, the bench, the center of the, the 2015 campaign. And I just wonder, you know, you talked about the AAA credit rating. Um, does hitting your targets factor into those, those assessments by yes. the bond rating agencies, or is it just the bottom line measurables? No, it's, well, it's, it's all, all of the above, I think. So, um, yes, they ran deficits higher than, say, $10 billion that they promised to in, you know, in the post-2015 era. Uh, COVID was a, you know, completely changed mm -hmm. the environment. I think if you look at the size of the deficit during COVID as a, as a percentage of the economy and look at where we're at right now, nobody's come brought you know, the deficit down faster than Canada and sort of the G8 countries. So they've really unwound those supports. You know, at a deficit a little over 1%, one, you know, 1 to 1.5 one percentage point of GDP, it, it's like not a problem right now. Um, but again, then the question is, what about the next shock, which we've right. heard from a lot of critics. And they're right. Like, we'd be, if we had a geopolitical crisis, another economic shock, a, a health shock, or would we, you know, would we have the largesse, the support, the, the economy in the way we did in the last two crises? And I think the answer is we have less room. But just as a final point, when you hear the criticism of the state of the finances and where the debt is and where the deficit is, when you look abroad, when you look globally, you actually believe this country is in a pretty good position at the national government level. Is that yeah, what you're saying? Yeah, abroad, when you look in a relative, you know, uh, when you look at you compare Canada versus, say, the OECD countries, um, but also historically, even in the Canadian context, having kind of been in the Department of Finance in the 80s and 90s, uh, you know, I mean, these numbers are not, uh, they're, they're, we're nowhere near fiscal crisis numbers. I mean, you know, you know, whether you look at debt or whether you look at deficits or it's the cost of public interest charges. Kevin Page, uh, President of the Institute of Fiscal Studies and Democracy at the University of Ottawa. Thanks for your time as always. Good to be with you. Now, there, there's, a, there's a fella who, uh, yeah, um, like that guy. Can, can we get him on this show? <laughs> that would be <laughs> lovely. Um, we Dad, are who, nowhere near fiscal crisis. Former nowhere PBO. Nowhere near. Nowhere near. Former PBO, right? Who's been working for finance since the 80s. He knows what he's talking about. And and, and like like a PNC Bio says, it's, it's, and I had to put it on the screen and I'll put it on again. It's almost like all the expensive people with expensive degrees who control all the money know exactly what the rating agencies are looking for. <laughs> Thank you, PNC Bio, because that's really good. That's funny. It's, I mean, come on. 
<laughs> like, I mean, come on, let's late, state the blatantly obvious here. It's like, so the expert in their field doing what they do with their expertise knows what they're doing? Yeah. Yeah, they do. They do. <laughs> yeah, they do. It's scary that, eh? <laughs> it's, mm. it's a mystery. I guess, and... No other country has unwound from COVID better Nobody. than Canada. They spent too much. They spent too long. They sunk the economy. They, none of it's true. I remember. None um, of it is true. During the start of all of it, in, in, in April of 2020, when uh, we were social distancing and we were sitting outside. Uh, so in, instead of scotch and cigar night on a Wednesday, it was like, this is just what we did every day because we had nothing else to do. We would sit at my buddy's place, but there was like two seats on the porch instead of four. Two seats on the porch, mm -hmm. a couple of seats in the front yard, which is like a cobblestone or sort of interlocking brick or whatever. And uh, that's what we did. That's what we did for like, I don't know, uh, I was, how long was I home for? Two months or a month? I can't remember. And we we, we would sit out there each day and talk about what the federal government was doing, the programs they came up with, CERB, SUS, all these other different programs. And all of my buddies, the progressive conservatives, the greens leaning, the, 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 the liberals, the NDP leaning, all of us said the same thing in unison. It was the necessary and right thing to do. We know people are going to accuse them of overspending we know that's going to happen, but this is what had to be done. It had to be done and it had to be done quickly and it had to be done to save lives. And that's what they did. And everybody said, look, they're going to come for his throat after this. We all know this. They're all going to accuse him, him of a million different things, but he did the right thing. And these are guys who do not like the prime minister who are mm -hmm. saying he did the right thing at the right time because it was necessary to save lives, period. End of yep. story. We know we know they're going to pillory him for it later. Yep. And the worst part is that none of us have any confidence that the conservatives would had based on their rhetoric. And, and, and Vim um, says, right, Mulroney said the same thing, right? Exactly. 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 So you have people listening to these announcements and saying, oh my God, where are we going to find the money? And Don Martin, I'm looking at you. Don Martin, we're going to find the money in the same place that the conservatives find the money every time they want to pro provide a tax cut or say that we're going to beef up the military. Yeah, yeah. Beef up the military. That's cute. Yeah, we're going to beef up the military. But guess what? If you get injured in, in, in battle, uh, you get a one-time payout. That's We're not taking care of you after that. Oh, and, and I know you lost your legs on a landmine in Afghanistan, but each year you have to prove to us that you still don't have legs. I'm not making that up. It's just that true and ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, and you will notice that uh, a lot of these provisions, there's about uh, $23 billion in new provisions that have been announced over the last few days. Again, if you're asking uh, where's all this money going to come up with, uh, for example, yesterday, a $15 billion top up to the apartment construction loan program to build a minimum of 30,000 new apartments was uh, was announced. With this top up, the program financing is on track to build over 131,000 new apartments within the next decade. There was also new reforms to the apartment construction loan program announced to increase uh, access to the program to make it easier for builders to build. Um, and these things uh, include things like extending loan terms, extending access to financing to include housing for students and seniors, introducing a portfolio approach to eligibility requirements so builders can move forward on multiple sites, things like that. These things are loan guarantees, right? They are, it's money that the government's putting up to guarantee loans or to offer loans because the federal government can borrow money at an interest rate lower than everybody else to borrow that money for us and then relend it to us at lower mm -hmm. fees so that we can build homes, rental units more, more quickly. So these are loan guarantees. So the only cost really to us is the loans that are defaulted on. So we have Tyler Meredith here on Twitter because, um, who, um, used to be the past head of fiscal and economic policy for the prime minister and the minister of finance minister uh, freeland and morneau 
from 2016 to 2022. And on Twitter yesterday, he wrote, Hi, Don, as to Don Martin, I've done six federal budgets. If you care to read the news release, you'll learn they're actually low-cost loans. Loans get repaid, just like your mortgage. The cost is just the set aside for bad debt, usually 5% of the total. So it's not really adding to the deficit. So uh, the $15 billion in loan guarantees, you count 5% of that, and that those may end up being bad loans based on what industry standards, that might be the maximum mm. cost to us. So Again, you can't always look at the top line numbers. It depends whether these are loans, loan guarantees, or whether or not they're actually direct transfers. So um, just little things to, to note. Um, now, when we talked about this call for an environmental uh, meeting, uh, the other thing that's interesting is that it seemed that uh, at the beginning of the week when the premiers were asking to testify, they were talking about four premiers, and the fourth premier was Tim Houston. Uh, Tim Houston did not testify, ultimately. So it was just Blaine Higgs from New Brunswick, Alabama, Daniel Smith from Alberta, and um, Scott Moe from Saskatchewan. Uh, it seems that Tim Houston is going to be following in Wab Canoe's footsteps and trying to present to the Prime Minister a made in Nova Scotia plan. Now, Nova Scotia did have one at the beginning, then uh, decided not to follow through on it or presented a plan to the federal government that the federal government said did not meet the standards in Nova Scotia rather than fixing it at the time, said, well, screw it. So the backstop was imposed. Uh, but it seems that they're trying it again. Now, Tim Houston is being conservative, cheeky, calling it still better than a carbon tax plan. Mm -hmm. <sighs> again, for the last time, Premier Houston, the carbon tax, as you call it, which is carbon regulatory pricing, is a backstop that applies only if you don't do your part. So the fact that you decide to do your part Yes, it is better than a backstop. Well, you know. Yes, doing your part rather than sitting on your butt and doing nothing and then accusing the federal government is indeed still better than a carbon tax. <laughs> I just don't know what to say about that. I mean, it's just like, that. that's right up there when the, the that... Uh, MPP in Ontario was complaining about license plates, you know, the, for Canadians who might remember don't live in Ontario, uh, the Ford government decided to change the license plates in Ontario to blue background to match the conservative logo with white, uh, Straight uh, white. Uh, lettering, stripping, yeah. And it turns out that the license plates were terribly made and unreadable and unscannable and all well, that kind of stuff. And shine a light had, on them and they don't work. <laughs> they go black. Yeah, and they had to essentially pull them. And then when they pulled them, like this. So even though they, they issued them and they were a bust and they had to pull them, you had one MPP from the Ontario Progressive Conservative Party stand up in the legislature and say, well, they were still better than those liberal license plates. Uh, the previous license plates weren't liberal license we're, plates. They were license. just the license plates that we had, white background, blue lettering like this, but you wanted to flip them so that there would be more. In blue. 1973, they came up with the slogan, Ontario, keep it beautiful. And I'm not sure when they came up with the slogan, uh, uh, yours to discover. Yours to discover. And that yeah. yours to discover has been there 30, 40 years. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it happened in the 80s yeah. or something because I remember yeah, it was when in I was the a 80s. Kid. It's yours to discover and you're going to love it in Ontario. A place to oh live, God, a place to mind. grow, and here I am. <laughs> Here I owe. <laughs> oh, speaking of a place to live and a place to grow in Ontario, I, -R -I, -R -I -O. Um, Doug yes. Ford, remember how he came up with a plan and said people are going to be able to get houses for $500,000? Remember that? Oh, oh. yes. Yes. Let's I just take that. a look at, um, oh, I see, I see a housing plan here for Innisfil, Ontario. Innisfil, Ontario is south oh. of Barrie, north of Toronto. Literally a podunk in the middle of nowhere. Matter of fact, let me just let, let me show you exactly when I can get the maps opened up here. Um, come on, Innisfil. Oh, there it is. There it is. I will just I will I will zoom in on Innisfil because when you see what Innisfil is, you'll be like, what, what, huh? So there's Innisfil. I'm going to bring it up on on screen here in just a second. 
Okay, so that is the community of Innisfil. I got it in the screen. But let me show you this first. Let me show you this first. This is this is um, uh, a plan. Guilford Estates, the Buckingham A plan in Innisfil, Ontario. And uh, yeah, okay, here we go. Have a look at this. We're just gonna we're just gonna start here with a T dot resident tweets out breaking new Doug Ford affordable housing plan just dropped. So this is called the Buckingham. Pretty nice. Gee, it's a yeah, mansion. Yeah. Guilford Estates, the Buckingham A plan, Innisfil, Ontario. Let me just show you Innisfil. Hang on, I'll just switch it up to Innisfil. So this is Innisfil. This is Innisfil. Let me zoom out so you get an idea of where Innisfil is. I'm going to zoom way out, <clears throat> way out, way out. And you can see there's Toronto and there's Innisfil. So, and there's Barry, there's Innisfil, Toronto, right? You get all, that all makes sense to you, right? Mm -hmm. well, let's take a look at uh, good old Dougie's um, uh, plan for affordable affordable housing i guess in the province of ontario guilford estates the buckingham a plan innisfil ontario so this is literally in the middle of nowhere right but it's north of toronto and and how much do you think mm -hmm. this house goes for just before i show you the number just throw out a wild number sir what do you think well it's definitely more than five hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. so <laughs> what are you thinking i mean there's look at the rooms in there that's at least a million i have to yeah. say how about 3.3 .3 million Jeez, 3.3 million in the middle of nowhere. 3.3 million dollars. Is it beautiful? Yes. Is it big? Yes. Is it 3.3 million dollars? No. Unless it comes on like a hundred freaking acres. It's a single family home if you're the freaking yeah. Waltons. <laughs> 3.269. Three two six nine uh, nine. Three point three million basically. Three point three yeah. point two seven million. Less a hundred bucks. <laughs> get Carol. Wow, he's smoking more than he yeah. sells. Don't get <laughs> high on your own supply, old Dougie. Yeah. yeah. Yikes. Like like honest to goodness. Like that is how Oh, wait, wait, oh, wait, I have some video to go with it. Oh, boy, is, this is going to, this, this is going to be great. This, oh, you're going to love this. You're going to love this, sir. What? This, this, this is, this is Doug. Last summer. Last summer. Old Dougie. We're in this province. We're going to make sure that we're going to donate land. We're going to work with our municipalities we're going to offer a 1,600 square foot home with a basement that's finished that you can rent out or have a family there. We're going to have a backyard with a fence. You're going to have a paved driveway under $500,000. You can't find a home under $500,000 anywhere in this province. <laughs> I'm sorry. He literally pulled that out of his backside. <laughs> Oh my goodness gracious me. Come on, Douglas. Douglas Ford. Douglas Ford. Please don't call Sorry, me Doug. Douglas. Old Dougie. Old Druggy <laughs> Dougie. That's, that's my know, name. <laughs> that's why I don't go by I Doug. Know. People like him. Ugh. Jeez. Yeah. Can, can you say absurdity? <laughs> yes. Uh, how are we doing for time, Mister? Got to roll on out, sir. I gotta, I gotta, uh, yeah, I gotta do some work. Uh, despite the fact that I'm in like incredible pain, I still have to go earn a living. All right. Um, a little note uh, yesterday because we uh, talked about uh, Joe Flaherty uh, as we were leaving. Um, one of the things about Joe Flaherty that we did not mention. Uh, but that's really important uh, because a lot of Canadians do this. Uh, they give back throughout his career. Um, he taught comedy writing within the comedy writing and performance program at Humber College in Toronto. Yeah. So he wasn't uh, uh, just a, a gifted comedian. He wasn't just someone who seemed to be a 
universally loved by everybody he worked with and described as a kind and generous soul. Uh, but he actually then uh, took his success and gave back uh, to Canadians by becoming a teacher. Pretty cool, Joe. Pretty cool. And sharing his gifts. So uh, just, uh, you know, there's something about Canadian celebrities, a uh, little bit of the down-to-earth part of Canadian celebrities. Well, he wasn't Canadian. But they did. Well, I, yes, but he's a Canadian yes, celebrity. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, no, you're right. Yes, he's definitely a Canadian celebrity uh, about uh, just g- giving back and doing things. You know, we saw that when we interviewed Sugu, uh, Sugith Varugesi. Um, you know, he too uh, is on the faculty uh, in certain places. And, uh, you know, Ryan Reynolds, who uh, donates to charities here. And, you know, the, there's something here. There's, there's something better, uh, often about our Canadian uh, stars who uh, don't forget where they came from and uh, come back and do a little stuff here. So I just wanted to mention that about him because even though uh, he is American born, he was very proud that people thought that he was Canadian and uh, he did more than just make a living here. He helped other people make their own living and realize their dreams. Yeah. All right. Uh, That's the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver podcast. We hope that you love listening to us because we love making this for you. Remember that sharing is caring and word of mouth is priceless. So please tell your peeps and poops all about us because when you talk about us, um, there is no better marketing whatsoever. Yes, Cassie. Like uh, Cassie, Joe Flaherty was so good on Freaks and Geeks. Yeah, he was. Indeed. Indeed, uh, the that's uh, if that's a show you missed when it was around the first time, and you're looking for some shows to binge, uh, Freaks and Geeks, yeah, you won't be sorry. No, it's really good. Yeah. And, and and who, um, who was it? We sort of introduced to that show was uh, Seth uh, Seth Rogen. Rogen, yeah, Canadian. yeah, indeed. Indeed. Um, ba, 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 ba. Let's see. I forgot where I was in my extra. Uh, yes. If you would like to make sure that you do not miss an episode, you don't have to. Thanks to the Ray Girl because uh, she sponsored our pod page. So if you uh, scan that QR code right under my chin, uh, that will bring you to our pod page site. And if you're listening, that's podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver, lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words. If you'd like to support us in other ways, please go to the true north eager beaver media incorporated YouTube page where our buttons like share and subscribe are waiting for you. Join our other three, 732 kits and uh, make sure that, that you what get you your 732. I you said 372. <laughs> No, no, 732 kits. And uh, make sure that you get your daily bowl of beaver grizzly goodness. Because. Bowl? Yeah, yeah, sure. We do. Yeah. Yes, we create the we curate the news, we comment, we analyze it, we serve it up in a piping hot, steaming bowl of yummy political and cultural goodness so that you go out with your day with a full belly. Uh, yeah, okay. I'll, I'll go with that. Yeah. I'll go with that. It's oatmeal, but it actually is like tasty oatmeal. <laughs> Gourmet oatmeal. I like uh, apples and so, peaches and cream. Mm-hmm. And if you'd like to support us in other ways, the QR code by Mr. Grizzly's Head brings us to the Emergency Hydration Fund. If you like our product, want to encourage us to do more. We are grateful for anything that you can do. If you have a couple of toonies or loonies, uh, making some noise in your pocket and you would like to put them to some good use, uh, please scan that QR code or go to our coffee page. That's coffee, K-O hyphen F-I dot com slash eager beaver, lowercase letters, all in one word. And uh, if you make a contribution there, it helps us with our costs for uh, bringing this show to you. And we are grateful for everything you can contribute. But of course, as we always say, the gift of your attention is the one that is the most important to us. And yes, Kit Tim, when we're talking about serving up a piping hot bowl, I am the brown sugar. (laughs) <laughs> you are what you eat, kids. You are what you keep. <laughs> be some brown sugar or be a hot dish. Ha <laughs> uh, So if you would like to, yes, I think I mentioned that. It's coffee, ko-fi.com slash eager beaver, lowercase letters, all in one word. We appreciate anything that you can donate to us. Because democracy is something that you do, please write your letters to your elected representatives and to your media. Let them know that you support 
a national school food program. Let them know that you're in favor of expanded access to daycare. Let them know that you were definitely interested in a renter's bill of rights and a homeowner's bill mm. of rights. Home buyer's bill of rights, I should say. Like this. Very important Indeed. stuff. Some good initiatives for you to support. From the Beaver Lodge, this is your eager beaver saying, it could be a tough world out there, so please be kind to and gentle with yourself. Mr. Grizzly, do you have some words of wisdom, please? Mm. I'll deliver them in the Easter egg. How's that sound, sir? I have an Easter egg for you. Oh, okie dokie. Yeah. Then uh, roll them credits. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. Well, so Ottawa's esteemed mayor, Mark Sutcliffe, Mm. ran on a policy of fiscal mm. conservatism. And one of the things that he's going to do is he's cut the budget that the city used to fund for the Tulip Festival in half. Yeah. And he's about to cut it. Next year, it'll be zero. So they used to provide $100,000 in funding. It's about to yep. drop to 50000 this year, and the following year it will be zero under his stewardship as mayor. Hey, Mark, Mr. Sutcliffe, Mr. Mayor, you do realize the hundreds of millions of dollars the Tulip Festival brings into the city in economic spinoffs. You do realize that there are companies that rely upon the tourists who come every year and some for the very first time and come to this city and stay in hotels and stay in Airbnbs and B&Bs and spend money in this city. A hundred thousand mm, dollar investment uh, is nothing compared to the hundreds of millions of dollars in economic spin-offs from the Tulip Festival. Yes. And you do realize, Mayor Sutcliffe, that the reason we have a Tulip Festival has something to do with the fact that the Canadian soldiers liberated the Netherlands during yeah. World War II and that this is a sign of friendship and love between our two countries, the donations of the tulip bulbs that have kept on all these years is an enduring sign of our friendship. And we are sister cities in Ottawa with the Hague. Yeah. Short term thing. Can I save a hundred grand? Really? A hundred. Tell you what, tell you what, Mr. <laughs> Mayor, why don't you and some of the councillors take a minor pay cut? We can come up with a hundred grand. The tulip festival is an iconic Ottawa Which event. Has been going on for, 70 years something to that it's been going on for a lot longer than i've been alive mm -hmm. so yes it's more precision actually it's not the the tulip festival specifically you're right kid jim sorry i was talking about our historic relationship with the netherlands in terms of we in terms of we liberating it but the tulip festival specifically is thanks for the fact that uh, princess magriette was born in ottawa in, because in the dutch royal family came came to it's Mag Magritte, sorry, Magritte. Um, they, they came to Ottawa and uh, that uh, the uh, the ward in which she was born was declared yes. Dutch right. territory for the time that she was born so that she could retain her citizenship. And uh, that's, a, a, yeah. a couple of blocks away from where my beloved lives. Yeah, so specifically uh, for that, but also you know the overall relationship with our uh, with our country. So yes, uh, uh, thank you for the precision kit, Jim. Um, on uh, my end, in terms of Easter egg, uh, today is National Refugee Rights Day. So the Canadian Council for Refugees uh, will be uh, 
engaging in some advocacy uh, today to urge the government to, quote, create a national plan to ensure the right to asylum with dignity, which the uh, uh, the group contends would serve as a, quote, coordinated national response that will save lives and costs less. So let's hope that that goes well. Um, and in terms of some Canadians that uh, do us proud, our uh, judokas were again among the best in the world. They competed at the IJF Grand Slam in Antalya, Turkey, and Krista Daguchi captured the gold medal in the women's 57 kilogram gold category. Uh, she's the world number one in her weight class, and she uh, got her second Grand Slam victory of the year, having won a gold medal in Baku, Azerbaijan in mid-February. She has not missed the podium of a single Grand Slam event in which she's competed since December 2022. That's quite a streak. On the men's side, uh, François Gauthier Drapeau got a silver medal in the men's 81 kilogram event. It's his best finish ever in a Grand Slam event. His first six Grand Slam medals were all bronze, so that's a step up for him, and he's currently seventh in the world rankings for the weight class. And uh, Shadi El Nahas, who we've talked about as well very recently, got a silver medal in the men's 100 kilogram event after four victories in a row. He's ranked sixth in the world. Uh, the world championships will be taking place May 19th to 24th in Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. And one month later, on June 23rd, the world ranking list will be used to allocate all Olympic spots by name for Paris 2024. The women's 57 kilogram event is one to keep an eye on for Canadians because uh, Deguchi, who we talked about, and Jessica Klimkate sit one and two in the world rankings. And it seems that when it comes to judo, uh, nations can only send one. Mm. Mm. So uh, that's going to be a, a definite fight. Uh, if you're following curling, the Canadian men's team is doing well. So far, only one loss. Uh, last I checked, I know that they had a game uh, early in this morning that I don't know the result of, so please don't spoil it for me because I'll be watching it at 10 this morning. And uh, the International Ice Hockey Federation's Women World Championships start this week. So uh, if you guys want to team, uh, cheer on... Uh, Team Canada, that's another way you can do that. And hopefully we'll have some more world championships and world champions next year and uh, next week when we... Uh, do off. quick things before I bail because I got to get the hell out of here. Uh, 283,000 Quebec households are out of power. 80,000 of them are in Montreal. This is due to the storm. Blackouts occurred overnight as 15 to 20 fen uh, 15 to 25 centimeters of snow uh, accompanied by gusts of, swim, gusts of wind swept through the south of the province. And the second thing is, I'm going to post it in the chat right here, is a link to Mademoiselle Fox's YouTube channels for her debut this evening at 7 p.m. Um, Mademoiselle Fox, uh, Fun and Feminist Conversations, debuts the officially debuts this evening on her YouTube channel at 7 p.m. So hopefully you can join in. And if not, that's okay. You can catch it on the replay later on. I got to go. All I'll right. Bye-bye.